Mike, welcome to the Dr. Tom Show. It's great to have you on today. I'm super excited that you can join us and our audience because I think the message that you have uh, is so, so important for everybody to hear. And I hope that some of the practical steps we can talk about can really help people make that change that I think is so needed for not only uh, individuals, but communities throughout the world. So welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I do. It's a uh... I, I try to take every opportunity to get this message out. Hope it doesn't sound too much like a soapbox. <laughs> well, I yeah. Sometimes you need to start with a soapbox, and I think it's um, it's an amazing message. And we're going to get into as we go through this recording what got you into this, which I think is so inspiring. Uh, but I just want to start off with a really open, simple question: How bad is sugar? <laughs> You're bringing the big guns right away, huh? Well, you know, I mean, I, I this is going to be a little bit funny maybe, but I try not to sugarcoat it for folks. Um, I try not to um, minimize, right? And it's been many years trying to evolve to the idea that the possibility that something that you can give to a baby legally and morally in a lot of ways is this toxic for the human body over time, right? And so I'm, you know, every day that I work, every day that it goes by where, you know, I get messages, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 a day on my messenger and on my email about the people who are addicted to sugar who cannot quit. They have doctors told they're 100, 200, 300 pounds overweight, losing limbs, going blind. I mean, most of this is pretty uh, well known now. The science is there. Uh, the diabetes, and they call it um, Alzheimer's diabetes 3 now. It really is a, a situation where uh, it's evolved into society over 300 years, and now the science has totally backed up this idea that this could be a toxic substance for the human body if taken in large enough doses over a large enough, long enough period of time. So... It's pretty bad, really. Um, one of my mentors by proxy, I've interviewed a couple times uh, and read all his books, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, believes that you should have uh, an ID and be 18 years old to purchase sugar. It should be an adult beverage type thing, right? Um, and, you know, I, I, I concur. I, I actually believe that. You know, that happened with cigarette smoking, in the 1960s, which is not that long ago, really, when you look at it, over 45% of the adult population in the United States smoked cigarettes. Today, that number is under 14. And really, that was brought about by the, uh, the science. Uh, it was really uh, an evolution. A lot of people thought, well, maybe you're not supposed to be taking smoke into your lungs, right? And a lot of people were anti-smoking, whatever. But the science really... Uh, brought it home, the litigation, the awareness, right? And so that's where we are, I believe, with sugar. We're in that pro the process of beginning to understand uh, that the science is there, the science evolves and gets better every single day, mostly a lot around the brain science. Um, we all knew about the glucose, which was, you know, playing with your insulin all the time, but now it's the dopamine, it's the serotonin, it's these things that the um, you know, the, the sugar is playing within your brain reward systems. And that's, I don't think if people really delved into the, into the, uh, into the science of it or spent five minutes in my inbox, they would, you know, they would understand that it really is for some people, about a third of the population, a very toxic substance who, you know, it, it borders on, I, I come from a background, most of the people that you'll talk to out there come from a background of health. They're health coaches, they're, they're trainers, whatever. But I'm an, I come from an addiction background, you know, for almost 35 years of sobriety. And the model of the, the, the sugar, the addiction part of it for about a third of people is they biochemically cannot ingest this stuff without uh, having cravings and continuing the cravings. So it's been, you know, a very eye-opening experience over the last four or five years when I really got into this heavily. But the answer to the question, the short version of the answer to the question, it's 
it's much more toxic than people believe it is. I think so. And I think so people are so stepped in with it that they don't really realize. And it's just such a normal thing in society. And well, there's a couple of things you said there, which we're going to delve into in a second. Um, I'm just really keen for you to share because I think your, your background story is brilliant, which gives you so much drive to do something. Uh, can you tell people, because you touched on it, your addiction background, what do you mean by that? What really got you into this in the first place? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but your bio says you have not touched sugar in 30 years. Correct. Wow. Well, I mean, I, I, it's not to say that sugar never passed my lips because a lot of people like uh, as a vigilant as I have that I have never had a candy, a Coke or a, a cake or a biscuit, they call it over there, I guess a pie. I, I've never had anything like that, but you know, people think it in, uh, uh, they make a salad dressing. They don't think agave is sugar, but to me, that's sugar, right? And occasionally that does happen. But um, yes, I've never had sugar in 30 years. And I raised two sugar-free kids. Where it all started, I'll, I'll kind of quote uh, one of your famous uh, countrymen, Eric Clapton. I don't know if you know this story, but Eric Clapton uh, was being interviewed by 60 Minutes, which is a famous program over here and Ed Bradley, they were at a $7 million Antigua uh, treatment center that he built to help people get off of drugs. And Ed says to Eric Clapton, he says, so Eric, this all started with heroin, this addiction thing, right? And Eric Clapton says, no, this started with sugar, Ed. And, and Ed's very quizzically, sugar? He said, yeah, it's just, when I was six years old, I was eating bread and butter and sugar sandwiches. And we used to eat those, right? Yeah. And so follow me with this, but basically what I've come to know deep in my soul is that it's a psychoactive drug that plays with our emotions, that, that we use to help cover up emotions, whether it's bad, uh, anxious, uh, nervous, scared, uh, and a lot of times it's covering up trauma. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be violent sexual trauma or physical abuse, but even small stuff. And so I was the same as Eric Clapton. In, in the early days, when I was a child, my mother was a sugar junkie. I believe my mother died of sugar addiction, right? Not Alzheimer's, not all the other 10 different maladies she had, but she died of sugar addiction because she just couldn't quit. And so I would evolve, I, you know, I unconsciously, like I believe everyone else, evolved to the point, um, or I, I was indoctrinated by the sugar in society that unconsciously I was ingesting a, a substance that's almost free for everyone to get their hands on, from, literally from the womb forward, this was happening, right? And we're playing with those dopamine and serotonin receptors in our brain. And so fast forward, it's really a short story beyond that is that 13 or 14, I discovered beer and now I can, you know, that sugar wasn't working as well, right? And so this, my state was changed with beer and that party lasted till I was 28 years old. And when I got healthy, um, I started, it was an accident truly, uh, where I read a book called Sugar Blues. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but it's by a guy named William Duffy. And Duffy is an interesting cat because he was at a party one time and he, uh, he was putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee and uh, he was a journalist and a voice from behind him said, I wouldn't have that stuff in my house, let alone my body. And it was the famous movie star, Gloria Swanson, right? And he ended up marrying Gloria Swanson. So anyway, um, they, I, I got that, got my hands on that book and I, I was newly sober and I just started reading it and I just kind of looked at it and I said, this is exactly like uh, the drugs and alcohol. I just can't put it down. I just keep eating lots of it. And I was a thin guy and I was gaining a lot of weight. And I mean, I started to study it years and years ago and there was some stuff in the literature, but very little. And the food programs that, that existed at the time, some of them didn't talk about abstinence of flour and sugar and that kind of stuff. They just, uh, it's a long story, but I'll, I can go in that. I think of myself as an anthropologist of those recovery groups. But uh, 
as I, you know, continued, I raised a couple of sugar-free kids. And then, uh, you know, I had a regular life, a regular business career. I stayed sober and stayed off sugar. And about 10 years ago, I picked up the domain uh, sugaraddiction.com. And in the early days, I would just give good information. I would, you know, the blog and, and, the, and a book and, and that kind of stuff. But no one really got sober. I mean, no one got off the sugar. And so then I, uh, I started to realize that people needed support and, and that kind of thing. So I, I started to help people one-on-one and then in groups. And that's how it, that's how it all evolved. Well, that's, that's the podcast version. That's the short version. I, I, can, <laughs> I, can, I can give you any uh, um, fill-in if you want. I think that's brilliant. And it's, it shows that it can be done. The social proof of you yourself, but also raising two kids is, is brilliant. Um, how would how would someone know they've got a sugar like how would someone just go okay actually i do have a sugar addiction because I, I believe m- the vast majority of people sleepwalking with it mm. but how can someone listening to this go and as tough as it is uh see they've got a sugar addiction and, and notice that what could be some simple things that they've noticed uh to to understand that well everybody always comes to us in the early days with the weight thing right and or health thing of some sort like the doctor says you got diabetes you're going to die if you don't be using sugar um they um but most of the time it's the weight thing um and the science is pretty um how shall we say uh i mean people can interpret it in different ways but when i look at it and talk to people um the science says that you know excess amounts of sugar cause excess amounts of weight on the body right? It's a pretty simple formula. Uh, We can debate it all you want, calories in, calories out, whatever. I don't believe in calories in, calories out. I I believe that, um, you know, a a lot of sugar is going to cause you to to gain weight. It doesn't matter how much you exercise, you can't outrun this. There's no way to, like, have enough exercise to outrun the quote-unquote calories. I don't like that word. I don't think it's uh, it's really, I think it's ridiculous because if you take a, it is. 10 calories of Mars bars and 10 calories of spinach, it's not yeah. going to do the same thing to your body. Um, uh, yeah, it's a complete con. Um, and that, anyway, that, that, that's just the first thing. And then the seemingly newer folks are really interested in this brain science stuff, really interested. And they are, you know, they've lost a parent to Alzheimer's or something, and they, they know that this could be possibly affecting their sleep and their anxiety and depression. And, and just because this has been enculturated for 300 years from England to Africa, pick up the slaves, go to the Caribbean, go to the United States and come back and grow the largest drug cartel in the world, that doesn't mean that just like cigarettes, that it's, it, it's not the right thing. It's not, it's not what we should be doing. Uh, it just happened that that's how we've evolved, right? So I agree. And one of the interesting things you said, things you said earlier is about state change. Uh, you know, how the drugs can change state, but the sugar can change state. And if we're talking about, oh, yeah. we're talking about brain and we're talking about the effects on the brain, which it, it categorically does have effects on the brain. Yeah. Um, it doesn't need to be the overweight people. It can be uh, it's right back to our, our children who've got behavioral issues or, you know, mm. concentration issues through to people um, getting older. You paranoia these uh anxiety attacks can all be linked into the sugar is that true absolutely and i think that's the part that people miss that that is a great question i think that's what people miss they because as i mentioned earlier this is a kind of a you have to follow this the you know you have to see the patterns coming in and going out meaning you have to see the withdrawal patterns you have to see the success patterns of people who have successfully eliminated sugar completely from their diet and what happens is they start to understand that the reason that they couldn't stop before is they had never tied together the uh, what the sugar was doing to their 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 mental feeling, how they feel, how they how they actually reward their, their brain chemicals, how they interface with the world, right? Because it's so ubiquitous and so almost free price wise that they just, their parents did this to them. They literally handed them stuff when they were screaming and crying to help them be quiet a little bit because they were busy and what have you. And it's just a, uh, you know, it just grew 
over 300 years into something that's very normal. But being normal when something like this, when the science starts to debunk the idea, it's not going to change just because 99 or 98 percent of the people um, think that it's fine to give to a baby. That doesn't change the reality. And so, you talked about eliminating. To really stop, do you have to eliminate completely? Do you have? Do you have to? <laughs> <laughs> my number one question, there, Doctor Tom. Yep. Right? My number one question: Do I have to do this for the rest of my life? Right. Because people are petrified of the idea that they can. That? Okay. People were pe are petrified at the idea that they would give up their sweet treats, right? They, so they're just afraid of it. And that level of fear, that level of anxiety and worry that that's what they're going to do should be a big clue, but it's not, right? Yeah. And the answer to the question is for a percentage of people, think of it in terms of alcoholism, okay? And as I mentioned earlier, I'm kind of, I don't know if my bio said it, but, um, Charlene sent you, but I'm the president of the Food Addiction Institute, which has yeah. been around since 2005. And uh, the board is filled with MDs and PhDs and people that own treatment centers who have seen the evolution of the healing, if you will, of people who uh, have gone to 12-step meetings and the food groups and what have you and watched them succeed with this. And they've watched them over years, decades some, right? And what happens is when they stop using the product, they change, their body changes, their mind changes, they come to a piece about the world. And so there's this underground world that has actually done this. They've actually succeeded at this process, you know? And those are the people we should, those are the canaries in the coal mine that we should be listening to, right? And so about a third of people by their numbers, the, the you know, the professionals, if you will, the doctors and the treatment center owners say, about a third of people biochemically cannot handle this product in their, in their system. They get to be um, obese and, and you know, physically a problem. And then about a third of people, they can go either way, right? They can fall one way or the other, and you can uh, force it on. And then there's a third of people that people we all want to hate because they can just have a half a cookie or half a, you know, a half a piece of pie and they'd be fine. And it's really parallels kind of alcohol numbers, right? Some people can drink alcohol, you know, no, never have a problem with it, right? Never worry about it. And it's that science that's the most exciting that we are finding out that some people are a little more sensitive than others. And it's that, it's, you know, it's that acceptance that has kind of been hidden in dusty church basements for 40 plus years where there are large amounts of success stories of people who have successfully um, gone 100% abstinence and who have tried, call it research and development, <laughs> have experimented with the idea. I mean, you know this, Tom. I mean, the recidivism rate of people who lose uh, large amounts of weight is over 90%, meaning mm. this is lore. This is like famous in the literature. People that lose you know 50 80 100 pounds 90 plus percent gain it all back in the first year right yeah and, and it's, it's amazing and that's the reason yeah it's amazing that they don't really kind of they don't understand why because they think it has to do with like you say exercise or running around or you know whatever or even a, moder a moderate moderate diet <laughs> it's it's crazy because i mean I think, it, I think a lot of that comes down to broken promises combined with something else. So you can, you can be doing really, really well and say, I'm just going to have that. Right. that simple action of having that, as soon as you put the sugar in the brain, you're going you're gonna to block leptin, which tells you that you're, you're full, your satiety centers have gone. Mm -hmm. And now that cascade just starts snowballing back down. Yeah. Um, that's it, right? That's it's right. so true. And I think Shakespeare says, is it, what is it? stepped in blood so far that to go back would be as treacherous as to go on in, in the sense that are we so deep into this that uh, you know how do we even possibly go back we might as well just push through it i mean mm. you, the, the ridiculous world of medicine is now bringing out pre-diabetic medication i mean this just doesn't even make sense <laughs> right right 
Um, so, I mean, give us some practical stuff that people can do, because I'm sure the majority of people listening right now are like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know this is going on and I can see it in myself and I, I want to do something. I'm scared of doing something uh, and I can understand that fear. What can they do right now to, to help themselves? That's a good question. And it's, uh, I'm kind of of the school of self responsibility in a lot of ways, but, um, you have to think for yourself. What I find it's really kind of interesting is that the people who succeed are kind of pioneers. They don't a lot of times give a crap what other people are thinking. You know, they're willing to do the research themselves use their own body as an experiment um, and just test it, read the literature and find out what's going on. Um, and I call it the gift of time, um, 90 days time. I, I'm, just try it for goodness sakes. Look, I'm not like, if I tell you not to eat steak for freaking 90 days or broccoli if you're vegetarian, whatever, a whole food product, you would say, okay, no problem. You know, and you just wouldn't eat it, right? You say, okay, that's the thing. You know, maybe that's, it doesn't even matter why. You wouldn't have any difficulty doing it, right? But when you tell someone to not use sugar for 90 days, now their, their whole world gets up in arms. They're, you know, they usually fail. Um, the, it, you know, this is not a, a one and done kind of thing. This is a process. So they go back and forth and back and forth. They get a week, they get a day, they get 10 days, they get 20 days, they, get, you know what I mean? they go back and forth. If that was the stake, they couldn't do that, you know? I mean, an allergist will scratch your back all the way down with pollen and grass and whatever, honey, you know, all these kinds of things they think you might be allergic to. It's just a test of the body to see what, what your body can handle. So just do the little 90 day test and see. Now I have never, in all the time of doing this, never had someone get to 90 days and risk going back to sugar. They're, they've lost weight, they're falling to a normal sized body. Uh, the anxiety is gone. They're sleeping better. The skin looks better. I mean, it just goes on and on. They just don't want to risk it because usually getting to 90 days takes, who knows, up to a year, sometimes up to 10, where they've been thinking about this, you know. They finally accomplished that 90-day goal, and then um, they don't want to risk because they know how hard it was to get that first 90, you know. And then they, you know, they're out, they're off and running. So. You know, people just have to um, realize that we're in, a, we're in a tectonic shift right now. We're, we're, you know, condoms in bathrooms, drinking and driving, all these kinds of things that uh, smoking in public places. This is going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And uh, we need to, you know, the pioneer folks, those canarians in the coal mine, they just need to think for themselves, right? Because the literature is there. The success stories are there and the experiment is easy. I mean, I don't want to say easy because it isn't easy. It's really difficult or guys like me wouldn't exist. Um, so, but they need to at least, you know, give it their best try. I think we just need a lot, a lot more social proof because I see so, so many people and they've got this thing that pains them, whether it is, you know, younger people with, really really bad skin for instance and they, mm. they know they should clean up their diet and it make a difference but th the yeah. pain of taking away the food seems more than the pain of actually getting better skin but i suppose it's it comes with social proof and more people like yourself uh, and the people you've helped coming to the fore and showing people you know what this does actually work do this it makes a difference right. i mean anything that's that's new it's normally you know it's it's ridiculed at the start people probably ridiculed you no. Now it's probably been violently opposed because there's some massive conglomerates and sugar companies that are going to lose a lot if people change. Yeah. And eventually it'll be accepted as the truth. Um, I'm really intrigued. I'm really intrigued to know what you think the potential for humanity would be if sugar wasn't there. Wow. That's a, that's a big one. And I, I'm kind of that type of thinker in, in a lot of ways. I, I really like to think about the possibility that I may see at least to look around the corner uh, with the success of what you call social proof where people start to have 
tribes and that kind of stuff where they actually, um, you know, groups of people who have succeeded or whatever businesses or whatever people, people have gotten together and done it. But I really see, I mean, nicotine, I mean, caffeine is one of the things that I don't think would ever be in, would ever be approved by the FDA this is over here, the food and drug administration. And I think sugar, um, is a double-edged sword and that it's sweet, right? And so, you know, people are like, can't be bad for you, right? It's like, but I really believe that society could, um, well, let's, uh, let's look at it, like kind of reverse engineer it. In your country and in the Canada where they have socialized medicine, they're not going to be able to, um, they're not gonna be able to, um, sustain the metabolic syndrome, the diabetes and that kind of stuff, uh, like 20 more years. That's it. That's all they got time-wise. Or you'll be paying 110% of your salaries to the medical system uh, in Canada and Great Britain. And, you know, the obesity rate, not sustainable, not sustainable to go from very little to over a third of the population obese and two thirds overweight not sustainable the the it's just not going to happen so physically i think it's a huge thing and one of the things along with being a pioneer i see the success stories you know you when you want to succeed you just want you want to find the patterns that are working right and the pattern that i see of people who do succeed is their life gets a whole lot better their life changes they grow in self-esteem Obviously, their physicality is much nicer or they, you know, they, they're much happier with it without any effort, really. The only effort is the abstinence. And so, you know, I just, I, I can't even really bring myself to imagine because I probably won't see it. But I believe a hundred years from now, they are going to say some things like they say about Coca-Cola. You know, they used to give sugar to kids, right? You know, it's going to be that same, you know, when Coca-Cola had ca cocaine in it, right? Yeah. It's going to be the exact same thing, but it's going to take time. Uh, the science is already there and, and it's going to take time for society to develop this way. So it's, it's a great question. It's a great uh, thought process. I believe the, uh, the grassroots stuff is very important. I think the policy stuff is important where they're trying to make, you know, taxes and tax on sugar and all that kind of stuff. I think that's a good thing. Basically more for awareness, right? Um, the drinking and driving thing and um, the cigarette thing. I don't know if you ever saw this picture, but there's a picture of uh, seven of the largest tobacco companies in the United States CEOs all with their hand up, their right hand up swearing in front of Congress that um, nicotine is not addictive, right? <laughs> so now we're looking down the road 30 years and we all know that there's no possible way that they could do that today, right? Because of the science. And the same thing I believe is already happening with the sugar. Uh, the the food companies and the sugar companies are going to play this completely differently. Um, I think it's Nestle has this gigantic plant in uh, Sweden where they're from, I think it is. But anyway, they literally are working on the next wave of products that do not have, that are more healthy, right? And it's not the greatest stuff yet, but it is a reduction. So it's starting to happen. And I think it's going to, no one knows where the tipping point in the United States, the tipping point for cigarettes was the litigation, right? It was, they sued the States sued the companies and that it wasn't so much, I mean, it was important and they brought all the science, but what was more important that that was a trillion dollar awareness campaign, right? That was a trillion bucks that they got, uh, the anti-smoking groups got because they were in the news for years, right? Straight years. They were always talking about this tobacco litigation. And you can graph that, like, to the reduction in smoking in the United States. And so I think it's going to happen in, in the sugar world, too. It's just going to be, it's just going to take time, and no one knows when it's going to accelerate or tipping point. Uh, but we need to be ready because it's not, 
that easy to do. But, I mean, people have a difficult time and there needs to be guys like you and I that are helping folks to do that. I agree. And it's got, it's got to happen. Like you say, you know, over here in Great Britain, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, I think people have been let down with the fact that they don't feel they need to take responsibility for their health. And that's not their mm -hmm. fault. It's the way that they've been educated. You yeah. know, as soon as we were young, the first thing put on our lips was cowpaw, which is full of sugar. It's a little, I don't know where we have it in the States, but it's a sugary drink we give to kids with some paracetamol in it to make them feel better. But obviously, there you mm -hmm. go. There's a sugar addiction straight away. Um, and I just imagine a world of people who are responsible for their health, healthy, uh, less aggressive, mm -hmm. less suppressed. Be, be an extraordinary place to be. I mm. think one of the things we need to get over is this this whole uh, genetics flaw where we're blaming everything on genes, which is a complete mm. farce because that doesn't exist. Um, very, very few conditions are truly genetic. Um, a lot of them are, are express poor expression of poor genes uh, mm. through lifestyle. One of those being sugar. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm just excited that people in the world like you are pioneering that and actually shining a light on it for, for individuals to make a real difference. So tell me where people can find out more about you, Mike. What, uh, what resources have you got for them uh, and how can they make a difference uh, to themselves and in their communities? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, I mean, uh, sugaraddiction.com is the in the main site and i always like to say if if you've made your way to sugaraddiction.com you probably don't even need to take a quiz <laughs> that you have you might have an issue with sugar i mean it's kind of like uh, drinking i guess if you think you probably have a problem you probably do you know if you've come to the point where you there's some concern some curiosity then you can definitely uh it, you know some of our work will help and you know, one of the things is, like I, I mentioned earlier, is that there needs to be some um, uh, group or individual support. Those members of the board of the Food Addiction Institute said, this requires an inordinate amount of support, right? And this doing it in a vacuum because of the society is just not plausible. And you feel like the odd man out. You, you, your family doesn't understand it. Your, um, you know, your workmates don't understand it. And so you have to go back to that pioneer spirit and you have to find a tribe of people who are, who, who believe like you and I do, that this could be a dangerous thing to be doing in excess, right? Now, you may be one of those third of people that can just put it down, but we don't usually deal with those folks. You know, we deal with the folks who are, you know, I believe biochemically sensitive and they have to, um, you know, they have to have some support both in information and in, in you know, uh, social kind of supports as well, or one-on-one or -on -one coaching, you know, so people, <laughs> one thing that amazes me is like people will like women, when a woman gets pregnant, she'll, she'll quit alcohol just like that. She'll quit cigarettes just like, I mean, it's literally even if they have a substance use disorder or they're a pretty big nicotine addict, if they find out that they're pregnant, they will quit th these products that day, it's like that day. It's an amazing phenomenon. And so I believe that, you know, the possibility that um, where all this kind of cuteness and, oh, you can have all these sugary things and people gaining 20, 30, 50, 80 pounds in the, during a pregnancy is something that uh, it's just kind of crazy, really. And I think when people realize that, that they'll, they'll, they'll do much better. Brilliant. Well, Mike, thank you very much for sharing some amazing information. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to encourage everybody to go across to the sugaraddiction.com. Uh, and we'll definitely put some notes about that uh, in the show notes for this episode. So people can have a look there. Yeah. Um, have you got any parting words of wisdom for our audience, Mike? Well, you kind of got my, my parting question or my parting words earlier. It's like, I just do your own research. Think for yourself. Do not be swayed. I, I don't like this. I, I do love the quote, but I, I, sometimes people hear it too much. It's, there's nothing, and it's one of the Indian gurus, I think. There's nothing 
I'm going to paraphrase, nothing great to be well adjusted to a sick society kind of thing. And, and just because we see this, um, because everybody else is doing it, my father used to say, if everybody else was going to jump off the bridge, would you jump with them kind of thing? Just because everyone else is doing it does not make it right. And if you were to do your own research and to delve into it and meet some people who have done what you want to do, which is um, maybe get into a right-sized body or get healthy, and um, they did it by abstaining from sugar, um, then you'd probably be better off. I mean, you've got to find your tribe. You've got to find your group of folks. So, Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's been very insightful. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you've got something from this episode, please share it, please like it, and please uh, let anybody know who you think might be struggling from a sugar addiction. Uh, check this one out. Check out thesugaraddiction.com and join us next time on the Dr. Tom Show. Mike, that was great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, really. I appreciate the work you're doing.